We've heard a lot about justice today. We've heard a lot about children. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is the exploitation of children. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His Quran praises the believers in Surah at Tawbah, He praises them with many different attributes Al Ta'ibun, Al Abidun, Al Hamidun, Al Sa'ihun, Al Raki'un, Al Sajidun. He says, Those that repent, those that are worshipful, those that are, praise, that, that are praiseworthy those who are people of praise, those who stand in night at prayer, those who bow, those who prostrate. He then says, Those who command good and forbid evil, and those who preserve the boundaries that Allah has set. And give glad tidings to the believers. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about our earnings. And he mentioned that our children are the best thing that we can earn. In fact, one of the greatest blessings of this life and the next and one of the things that lasts in perpetuity after you die. When a person dies, three things are cut off. Or everything is cut off except for three. It's beneficial knowledge that's left. Charity that works in perpetuity taking care of others. And a righteous child that makes dua for you. In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, Man kana lahu thalath banatin fa ahsana ilayhinna kunna lahu hijaban min al nar. Whoever has three daughters and he is good to them, then he, then he, then they will be a shield from the hellfire for him. Someone in the crowd said, Ya Rasulullah wa bintan. O oh, Messenger of Allah, and two daughters. He said, and two daughters. The narrator said, we didn't ask about the one. Because they knew the answer. Before we jump into this, project, this, this topic, capitalism is one of the reoccurring themes that are here. Let me say that Islam as a faith is neither capitalist or socialist. We do not follow others we lead. And therefore it is wrong for us to inherently make our faith subject to and subjugated by other ideologies and thought systems. In general, capitalist economics are motivated, motivated by several things. The motive to make a profit. The idea that you can pursue your self-interest without any input from anyone else. As long as it is good to you, then it's considered good. And the freedom to choose how you consume, what you consume, what you produce, what you invest, so on and so forth. These are the types of ideals that we hear. In reality, we have a long history of what's promoted as capitalism or free market economics being extremely oppressive. At one time in this country, child labor was a huge problem. Today, maybe only half a million children actually work before the age of 16 in conditions that must be rectified. 
But starting in the 1800s into the 1930s, the tide started to change. The level of economic output increased. The ability for people to stay at home and keep their children at home without having them work for them increased. The United States, like many other developing or developed nations at that time, implemented the Prussian education model of what's called factory schools. Schools where education is mandatory, attendance is mandatory, and children are prepared, not just with technical knowledge, but with social and moral ideology as well. Children would become future producers and consumers. So now you have more proficient adults that are a self-contained marketplace in themselves that they can extract value from. Now why was child labor outlawed in the United States? We know that it exists in many other countries. And I think one of the best documentaries that you can watch on that is a documentary that was done by Al Jazeera about fabric manufacturing in Bangladesh. All of the statistics that you need can be found there and in other documentaries. But why was child labor outlawed here? Well, they said children working full time before the age of 16 is harmful to them physically, it's harmful to them emotionally, and it's harmful to them mentally. Even if they have a need to work because of abject poverty, it still fails to benefit them because it stunts their growth. And they are unable to develop past the work that they're doing. It arrests their potential. And thirdly, because children do not have fully formed minds. So they are weak agents, which is why they have guardians and parents and those who take care of them. They are unable to make decisions in the same way that an adult is able to make a decision. So the idea of harm, the idea of developmental issues, exploitation, all of this meant that we should not have exposed children to circumstances that are beyond their ability to cope with, whether physically, mentally, psychologically, or emotionally. So if we're going to say that child labor is bad, we have to also say that anything that harms a child in a similar fashion is also bad. Now remember we said that we are looking to create a marketplace out of people. We want to commodify the individual. We don't want just the software as a service. We don't want just to sell you anything, but we want to keep you continuously consuming, feeding into your desires, making you come back to buy more. But when you have a moral basis, which tells you that you should not follow your desires, have you not seen those who take their desires as a god. This is called shirk al-hawa, polytheism of your personal desires. When you have a moral basis that doesn't allow you to continuously consume, something has to be done to break that down. And this, brothers and sisters, is one of the most dangerous things that our children face today in the marketplace of goods, in the marketplace of ideas, in their schools, in their extracurricular activities. It's almost safe to say everywhere except their home when the television is not on is not a safe space for them. From the 1960s, there's been a shift in America. A shift to market to niche ideas that people have.
to their personal ideologies, to their personal to de desires, to things that were seen as immoral, but are now considered to be normal. Looking for alternative customers means that you have to find alternative markets. Remember when we said that child labor was outlawed because it was harmful to children physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. We now have a movement in the United States, and this is the term that's used in books of business and marketing, pink capitalism, where the niche market of selling goods and services to LGBTQ people became a marketable segment of the economy. Now, how does this relate to children? People of the boomer generation only identify with this ideology to about 7% total. Millennials, however, are at about 20%. Why is that? because games and movies and television and now public schools are pushing an ideology on children to blur the lines of gender, to blur the lines of morality, to blur the lines of who they are even in their physical body. Things which were considered dysmorphia are no longer considered as such. Now you might, want, you might say, well, what does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with children? Well, if we can create a segment of people who are more leaning towards spending more, then we can make more money. What we think of capitalism is many times corporatism. It's corporations doing whatever it takes, even if that means pushing immorality to make more money. People from the LGBTQ community generally statistically spend 15% more than their heterosexual counterparts. 2017 spent around $917 billion. In 2021, it was $1.4 trillion. Why is this important to understand? It's important to understand because studies have shown that children are not able to handle sexual content, illicit content, ideas that go beyond their age and their emotional capacity but which are now being introduced to them in public schools by teachers who are telling them, telling your children, don't tell your parents about this. Don't allow your parents to know what I'm teaching you. Quite honestly, I'm embarrassed to even repeat some of the things that I've seen of homework assignments and videos and so on and so forth. I'll allow you to go and look that up yourself. But why is this so important for us to stave off, to put a stop to? You might be saying, well, we have people who choose whatever they want to do as adults. We're in the United States, they can choose whatever they want to do. Did you know that statistics for child abuse we also, we mo almost always think of child abuse, child molestation, in terms of an adult taking advantage of a child. For every one child that is attacked by an adult, they have experienced the same. There are seven children who have experienced the same from other children. And by blurring the lines of what is moral and immoral, by introducing subjects to children at such a young age, 
Not only do we corrupt their innocence, not only do we exploit a vulnerable population, but we do so simply to line the pockets of those who wish to sell them and sell them more. Whether those sales be services, medication, substances, long-term treatment, surgeries, it's very disturbing. If you were to see the statistics of those who struggle with LGBTQ ideology, you would be alarmed. You would not want your children being, having this normalized for them. Almost 30% to 40% attempt or have contemplated suicide. Abuse, drug use, and all other forms of not only illegal but immoral acts are rampant. And these are studies that you can find easily online. Greater, just children who are ex exposed the sexually explicit content have greater rates of anger, violence, and emotional disturbances. There is nothing that a corporation, a pharmaceutical corporation or others would love more than to be able to sell you pills for the rest of your life, to make you something that you're not, that Allah did not create you as. So this disturbing trend in our schools is very similar to the disturbing trend of forcing children to go and work in factories. It is harmful to them physically. It is harmful to them emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. It stunts their growth. It makes them at risk. It exposes them to a plethora of problems that last with them for their lifetime. And so I'm speaking to you about this today because I think it is absolutely necessary. You might say, isn't it fine and good? It's not a concern for us. Our community doesn't do that. We don't have that problem. This is patently false. Number one, because we as a community are consuming the same media, sending our children to the same schools, being marketed to by the same corporations. You only need to speak to Muslim mental health counselors to know the extent of the issue in our community. The Prophet wasallam said, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةِ أَوْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ you are the best nation brought out for people. You order the good and you forbid the evil and you believe in Allah. You might say to yourself, why should I be concerned? Other people can choose whatever they want to do. As long as they don't act on it, it's not a problem. And I'm here to tell you again, that is patently false. The Prophet said, من هم بسيئة فلم يعمل بها كتبت له حسنة. Whoever has the urge to do an evil deed but does not act according to it, it will be written for them as a good deed. So if you struggle, there's still good, there's still hope for you and good and good things for you. But let's not be blind to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man hamma bi sayyi'ah. So the intent was there, the urge was there, the action was not, was not performed, but the value judgment on something being good or bad, righteous or evil, is absolutely a must for us to recognize. It's not enough to say, I don't do it, do whatever you want. No, I don't do it and I don't want you to do it.
because I have a divine charge to command the good and forbid the evil. I have a divine charge to guide people to the best of this life and the next. With schools normalizing gender studies, mixed gender bathrooms and locker rooms, and a number of other issues, this is extremely important for us to take seriously. And I'll conclude with this. We have to realize the capitalistic tendencies to commodify identity and market those identities who, to whoever will buy into them. To extract profit from those people It is our divine charge to make sure that we prevent harm. There should be no harm nor reciprocating harm. To allow children to develop into full-fledged adults who are physically unmaimed, emotionally mature, and mentally sound. They should not be forced into an oppressive power dynamic that imposes on them things that they cannot handle. Just as you would not put your child in front of a piece of heavy machinery, you should not put your child in front of this very dangerous ideology. We have to pay attention as parents and educators to what our children consume. Look at statistics behind those people who draw cartoons for a living and the types of cartoons that they drew before they got hired for children's cartoons. You will be surprised. What do our children consume? Who is teaching our children and what are they teaching them? What are they normalizing for them in the name of equality and justice, which is simply vulm and immorality? We cannot be part of the machine which seeks to commodify and segment both the human psyche and the human body. We are not those who trade in human lives. We should never work to deny others their innocence, potential, and dignity. We should do all we can to avert anyone being damaged physically, mentally, and spiritually. We should not allow ourselves to be part of those machines that seek to wring out profit from every immoral act possible. And I'll end with this. Think about your role in supporting good and preventing bad. The Prophet ﷺ said, من سن في الإسلام سنة سيئة فله وزرها فعليه وزرها ووزر من عمل بها لا ينقص ذلك من 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 وز من أوزارهم شيئا. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Ali Sallam said, "Whoever initiates an evil norm in Islam will bear the weight of that sin, and the weight of the sin of all those who act according to it, without diminishing the weight of the sin from those." in anything. May Allah make us from amongst the guided. May He make us from amongst the moral. May He make us from amongst those who repent and turn to Him, who order the good, forbid the evil, and who maintain our place within the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.